Welcome to another seminar of the monthly series in critical psychology hosted by Steelpoint. I'm Maria Laguna, and today we will be discussing climate change from a critical psychology lens. Our planet is changing before our eyes. It's becoming harder and harder to deny the impact of climate change in all communities around the world. The most recent report compiled by the World Meteorological Organization on behalf of the UN gather reports from these global organizations dedicated to monitoring climate change across the globe. Some of the takeaways from this report are painfully familiar to us. Climate change is already affecting every region on the planet. The world is warming faster than before. There's more intense rainfalls associated with flooding. The sea levels are continuing to rise. And for some cities, some aspects of climate change are already amplified, such as higher temperatures and flooding from heavy rains and sea levels rise in coastal cities. It's becoming increasingly clear that a big part of climate change is human induced. Emissions of greenhouse gases from human activities are responsible for approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming since 1900s. Unless carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, global warming is expected to increase. As alarming as this may sound, there's still a window in which humans can alter the climate path. Aggressive and rapid cuts in greenhouse emissions beginning now could limit the warming beyond 2050. One of the ways in which mainstream psychology can help us think about climate change is by studying the psychological barriers that lead to inaction. One of these barriers is uncertainty. The fact that it is impossible to fully predict the rate and extent of impact of climate change over our communities. This can be an obstacle for taking action, as though we were saying, well, it's actually impossible to predict how we're going to be affected, so there's no need to change. Research has shown that uncertainty over climate change reduces the frequency of environmentally friendly behaviors. Mistrust is another obstacle. Not believing the risk messages of scientists or government officials can also lead to inaction or indifference. Denial, which in this case consists on the belief that climate change is not occurring or that human activity has little or nothing to do with it. Another potential barrier is undervaluing risks of climate change. A study of more than 3,000 people in 18 countries show that many people believe that environmental problems will worsen in 25 years. While this may be true, this type of thinking could lead people to believe that changes can be made later. The feeling that we don't have enough control over the environment can lead people to believe that their actions would be too small to make a difference and therefore they may choose to do nothing. Habits, it's another obstacle. Certain ingrained behaviors can be extremely resistant to permanent change, while others can change slowly. And finally, dependency, or the belief that someone else will take care of it for us. Another way in which mainstream psychology can help us think about climate change has to do with studying the effect it has on the population. According to the most recent report of the American Psychological Association on Climate Change, about 50% of the people interviewed reported that climate change is a significant source of stress for them. Climate change could also lead to increased feelings of loss and helplessness. Psychology can also help us assess the ways in which we can mitigate the impact of climate change. It can help us wonder, for example, how prepared we are, what actions we should take to protect ourselves and our families, and what influences our motivation to change. Mainstream psychology also helps us understand what informs individual behavior and how people can change it, such as recycling, 
reducing the consumption of meat, plastic, opting for sustainable transportation, and making choices that are more environmentally sustainable. These changes may come with the reward of us feeling that we're doing our part. Although these behaviors can have a significant impact if implemented collectively, they do not address the root of the problem of consumption and has little impact on the greenhouse gas emissions that are primarily responsible for climate change. What does critical psychology have to say about climate change? While mainstream psychology tends to focus on the individual barriers for inaction and the individual impacts of climate change, critical psychology resists this paradigm. Rather than the sum of individual actions, critical psychology is concerned with how system dynamics of capitalism and empire are directly connected with climate change. By doing this, Critical psychology shifts the focus of individual responsibility to the social, political, and historical determinants of climate change, analyzing the relations of power, privilege, and oppression, and their contribution to the status quo. Critical psychology recognizes that there's something bigger than ourselves. It emphasizes the power of collective resistance the shared experiences of loss, and how these have the potential to unify and mobilize entire communities. In addition to the behavioral changes that we discussed before, critical psychology takes into account other forms of environmentally friendly behaviors, such as activism, protest, and resistance. Critical work understands affects and emotions in context. They don't exist separate from someone's living conditions. Understanding and intervening with someone's distress cannot be divorced from the geography and relations of power that affect that person and their community. Critical work understands the importance of language and discourse. Words matter and the way we use them to represent reality changes our perception and shapes our understanding of the world we live in. For example, whether we refer to climate change as a hoax, a threat, or a scientific fact will have significant impact on how we approach the problem. Which leads us to wonder, is the term climate change reflecting accurately the seriousness of the situation, or should we refer to it as climate emergency? And what about the words that some companies use to suggest that their products are environmentally friendly? Paying attention to language and discourse help us think critically about the words we use and whether they reflect our reality. For example, greenwashing is the process of conveying a false impression or providing misleading information about how a company's products are more environmentally sound. It involves the act of making false claims to deceive consumers into believing that a company's products are environmentally friendly when they may not be. Critical psychology asks questions about whose voices are ignored and suppressed when responding to the climate crisis. They're interested in citing and researching voices of resistance, especially from marginalized populations. Critical researchers want to know how power is distributed and why people in positions of power choose to use that power in particular ways. Critical work wants to shed light on injustices commonly overlooked. It considers the gender and race specific impacts of climate change. To put it simply, those with economic security are more likely to be protected from the harms of climate change while those who identify as trans and queer are more likely to be living on lower incomes, experience homelessness, and have limited access to healthcare. The topic of climate change is becoming more and more present in therapist offices, especially coming from younger clients. We see their anxieties and our own as a natural response to an actual threat. Eco-anxiety 
can lead us to take action or, on the other hand, can be a debilitating and paralyzing feeling, especially for those who already suffer from anxiety and depression. Day after day, we are confronted with the fact that nature is not opposite to our internal worlds, but a huge part of them, and one cannot exist without the other. In her book, Climate Crisis, Psychoanalysis, and Radical Ethics, Donna Orange reflects on the importance of psychoanalysis to think and address the climate crisis. Psychoanalysis is especially equipped to deal with the defenses against anxiety. It helps us name the forms of traumatic shock that keeps us too paralyzed to respond appropriately to current challenges. This applies to our personal lives, but also to our collective life on Earth. Psychoanalytic therapy recognizes that trauma can be overcome when it's acknowledged and witnessed, when traumatic losses are mourned and a new integration can take place. Often, the most painful part in overcoming a trauma is working through the shame that the person has contributed to their own destruction. Orange suggests that this process of acknowledgement and mourning also applies to the climate emergency. Psychoanalysis provides tools to understand our defenses against anxiety. Denial, for example, it's a mechanism that involves ignoring the reality of a situation to avoid anxiety, as though we were saying, no, climate change is not happening. Negation, defense against feelings of anxiety and loss. It is a way of denying what has already happened as though we were saying, no, we have not caused any damage to the planet. In the defense of disavowal, reality is a little bit more accepted, but its significance is minimized. It is a form of knowing and not knowing at the same time. For example, disavowal of our destructiveness to others and to the earth protects ourselves from feeling guilt and pain but it also keeps us distant from certain realities that we can actually change. Projection happens when we put undesired aspects of ourselves in other people. For example, sometimes we choose leaders that embody split of aspects of ourselves that we don't want to recognize. This way, we don't have to confront our feelings of greed and guilt for our contribution to climate change. In their book, A History of the World in Seven Cheap Things, Rak Patel and Jason Moore invite us to think how we can interact with the web of life differently. Many of these ideas, I believe, are in line with critical psychology. First, they discuss the importance of recognition, recognition of dualisms that have served to dominate the world, such as society and nature, colonizer and colonized, man and woman, capitalist and worker. These categories of thinking are historical, but they're not eternal realities. It is by recognizing our relationship between humans and nature that we can imagine a possible change. Patel and Moore reminds us that states are not the only bodies responsible for damage of the planet and subsequent reparation. Corporations also owe their debts. Another point they discuss is redistribution. In a patriarchal system, the redistribution of domestic work is a central part of imagining reparation ecology. Redistribution of energy, food, lands, and places where humans can interact with nature and with one another. Reimagination involves thinking of the world we would like to live in, instead of being busy trying to adapt to the world that we have. It involves daring to dream of a different reality. Recreation. Recreation, which involves rethinking our relationship with work and reclaiming our ability to play, experience pleasure, and rest. Critical psychology reminds us that our inner and outer journeys inform one another and are completely intertwined. 
instead of focusing on ways to change our individual behavior, critical psychology invites us to identify already existing practices in which people are changing their circumstances themselves and their relationship with the planet. People who think outside the box of Western culture and whose voices have been systematically oppressed.